Hello, good evening. I'm Barry Edelstein, Erna Fincy Viterbi, Artistic Director of the Old Globe in San Diego, California. And I'm extremely happy to be with you this beautiful evening for the fifth program in our series, Thinking Shakespeare Live, The Sonnets, the fifth one. I mean, my goodness, this has been uh, going on for a while, I guess, at one every two weeks. But you know, it's given me an excuse to delve into my Shakespeare, and I've actually sort of loved it and grown from it. The Old Globe believes that theater matters, and our commitment is to make it matter to more people. We see theater as a public good, a thing that enhances quality of life and makes a difference in people's lives and in our community. With our three beautiful theaters in Balboa Park temporarily closed, we can't make theater matter in person, so we have migrated our output here to digital platforms where we can make virtual theater and serve the public good in an alternative form. I'm extremely pleased to be with you and to jump in to another program about these extraordinary 154 poems. Now, uh, I've gotten quite a few questions about how the Globe's actually doing this, how we're putting our work online. And here's a picture of my setup. I'm coming to you live from world headquarters in exile of the Old Globe, also known as my dining room, one part of which you can see behind me. But there on the screen is the reverse angle. And that's my setup, a couple of laptops propped up on some boxes and books and a fancy microphone and those really bright lights that are shining on me. And uh, that's how we make this thing work. I've also got this magic keypad here. I'm going to show you how that works, right? I've mapped all my little uh, pictures to it. When I press this button that says swap, hey, there I am. And I get big instead of small. So uh, my right hand is on this little keyboard. Keyboard. My other laptop here is to my left. I've got my Bright Star mug there to drink out of. Little mm, Old Globe Broadway water. And, um, and that's how we're doing it. So thank you, everybody, who's been checking in. Now, you know, on March 12th of 2020, I was the artistic director of a major American theater. And uh, on March 13th of 2020, I transformed suddenly and instantly into the president of a new media company. As the Globe has moved its arts engagement programming and its artistic programming and its humanities programming and basically all of its entire production apparatus here online, we have transformed. We have turned ourselves into something new. And that is a big Shakespeare idea, turning yourself into something new. People turn into things over the course of his plays. A, a good soldier turns into a murderer in the Scottish play. A studious prince turns into an avenger in Hamlet. A confirmed bachelor turns into the world's most powerful advocate for marriage in Much Ado About Nothing. The stories of Shakespeare's plays are about transformation. And there's one that's maybe the most famous of all, and it's this. There's a Midsummer Night's Dream, and there on the right is Bottom with an ass's head. In that play, a man is turned into an animal, and a man's head is replaced with a donkey's head by some sort of the magic of the forest and the magic of theater. And when his friends see Bottom with his ass's head, they say this extraordinary line, Bless thee, Bottom, bless thee. Thou art translated. Thou art translated. Interesting Shakespearean word. We know what a translation is when you take a piece of literature from one language to another. The word literally means to move across, to translate. But in Elizabethan Jacobean English and in the way Shakespeare uses it here, it has a broader sense of being transformed, being metamorphosed, if I may use a fancy word. And metamorphosis is not only one of Shakespeare's biggest ideas, but it's also the big idea of Shakespeare's most favorite writer. And that is where I want to spend our time this evening as we delve into these sonnets in the world of Shakespeare's favorite writer. Who's this guy? 
Ovid, the Roman poet who lived uh, right at the time of the birth of Christ and was one of the most famous Latin poets, one of the greats, and really was Shakespeare's favorite writer. Ovid is all over Shakespeare. And given that Ovid is the poet of transformation, his famous work, The Metamorphoses, which is this one here, The Metamorphoses, and the translator that Shakespeare would have read says about the book that it's about shapes transformed to bodies strange, I purpose to entreat. I'm going to talk to you about shapes transformed to bodies change. Ovid is the great writer about change. And given that I'm someone who has transformed from a theater guy to a new media guy like that, I'm kind of an Ovid fellow. Uh, I would hasten to say that this entire pandemic that we're going through is an Ovid moment. Uh, I actually thought you can't spell COVID without O-V-I-D. So, uh, Forgive me, I know that's terrible, but you know, it really is about that. And for Shakespeare in particular, Ovid and the thoughts of Ovid are absolutely central to his life, who is output. There is uh, the translation that Shakespeare would have read. You see it there, Metamorphosis in the middle. And that's the translation of Arthur Golding, the English translator from the Latin of the Metamorphoses, and that was published in 1567. And this book gave Shakespeare source material throughout his entire career. One of the stories in the Metamorphosis is about Venus and Adonis. There's a painting of uh, the death of Adonis being mourned over by Venus, Shakespeare turned that Ovidian material into his epic poem, Venus and Adonis, at the beginning of his career, 1593, when he was a young man. This was his first enormous success, and he took it lock, stock, and barrel from Ovid. His plays are full of the metamorphoses. Uh, there's uh, the, one of the big stories in the Metamorphoses is the story of Philomela and her sister Procne and Procne's terrible husband Tereus who rapes and violates Philomela and then uh, to make sure that she doesn't talk about it he takes a knife and he cuts her tongue out you can see that happening horrible horrible moment in this painting well that very story shows up in Shakespeare's early tragedy, Titus Andronicus, there you see Lavinia kneeling in a, in a Globe production of some time ago. Exactly the same thing happens. She's violated by a terrible guy who then, tell, in order to make sure that she won't talk about it, mutilates her by chopping at her tongue so that she can't speak. And do you know how she communicates to people what actually happened to her in the play? She has a copy of Ovid's Metamorphoses, and she hands it to someone, and he reads through the book, and he sees what she's reading, and that that's the code that explains to her family the terrible thing that's been done to her. The Ovid is literally in the play. Pyramus and Thisbe, another story from the Metamorphoses about uh, a mistaken death and about the suicide. That is the story that's sent up at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream, where the, the mechanicals put on a show about Pyramus and Thisbe. They don't do it terribly well. They take a comic approach to it inadvertently, which is different from the tone in Ovid. But again, Shakespeare takes Ovid and moves it, plants it right in the middle of one of his plays. Another one, Pygmalion and Galatea, the story of a, an artist who sculpts a beautiful woman in his studio out of marble, and then that sculpture comes to life. And Shakespeare famously borrows that moment at the climax of The Winter's Tale, my favorite Shakespeare play, where he takes a little piece out of Ovid and he plants it in one of his plays. So Ovid is tremendously central to the plays. Ovid is tremendously central to the sonnets, which we're going to see tonight. Now, I could go on for hours about Ovid and Shakespeare. Luckily, I don't have to because the great Shakespearean Jonathan Bate wrote a book about it, Shakespeare and Ovid. If you're interested in the subject, grab that book. It's from, I think, the middle of the 1980s. Jonathan Bate, one of the greatest Shakespeareans working today. It's a fantastic book that Bate basically threads Shakespeare's relationship with Ovid through his poems, through the sonnets, and through all of his plays. Now, the idea 
of transformation in uh, the plays and in the sonnets is only one piece of what's Ovidian about Shakespeare's work, because also in Ovid throughout the Metamorphoses is a tremendous sense of linguistic playfulness. The transformations in the stories extend to the actual texture of the writing themselves. They're full of puns, they're full of wordplay, they're full of complex paradoxes, they're full of riddles, and this goes right to the heart of Shakespeare. He's nothing if not a lover of puzzle and paradox and game, intellectual game, witty game, games with language, games with words, and we see that so powerfully here in the sonnets. Now, I was having a conversation with the great Bill Irwin about this subject. Some of you may have seen our wonderful world premiere Zoom play a couple of weeks ago called In Zoom. There's Bill Irwin on the right, reaching his arm across cyberspace in a transformational moment himself that turns Zoom into a physical thing. And Bill and I were talking about the sonnets, and Bill is a great Beckettian. He's a great student of Samuel Beckett, one of the tr truly greatest poets of the 20th century, poets and playwrights, and a Shakespearean figure in his love of wordplay and density of language. And Bill was observing that, like Beckett, the sonnets are extremely dense, and sometimes the density and the wordplay of them makes them kind of make your brain hurt, makes them boggle you at how a literary figure can be so tremendously playful and complex. And so that's what I want to look at in the sonnets and in the material that we're going to dive into tonight. What's like Ovid about them, the transformational uh, notion of them, the paradoxical notion of them, the extraordinary linguistic texture of them that makes them so rich, so dense, and so complex. The sonnets are in love with puns and wordplay. Here's an example from Sonnet 104. To me, fear, to me, fair friend, you never can be old. For as you were when first your I, I, I'd, such seems your beauty still. When first your I, I, I'd, now, Shakespeare knows what he's doing there. He's using the word I, E-Y-E, -E, in two different senses, as a noun and then as a verb. And then he's putting the personal pronoun I in the middle of it. This isn't happening by accident. Famous early 20th century Shakespeare scholar A.C. Bradley has a great line. These little things in Shakespeare are no accidents. This is on purpose. This is a writer who knows he's playing a game with I, your I, I, I'd, and part of the fun of the poetry is enjoying that sense of playfulness. He does it in the plays, too. There's a photo of a recent Globe production of The Merchant of Venice, one of the great, great Shakespeare comedies from his middle period. And of course, it's about the Jewish moneylender Shylock. And Shylock, as a moneylender, practices usury, use, usance, and he gives a very famous and big and long speech about lambs who give birth to use. So in the play, there are all these uh, switches between use and use and usance and usury. And then there's another level of craziness, which is Shylock is a Jew. But in the printed English language in Shakespeare's period, there was no figure for the capital J that we use now. And if you wanted to write a capital J, you would do what they did in Latin, which is use the uppercase I. So if you see where I've got my little blue arrow there, he says, what's his reason? I am a Jew, spelled I-E-W-E. So even in the printed book, there's another pun on you. Use, 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 Jews. And Shakespeare is just this like incredible crossword puzzle addict who's playing these games. Uh, when you go see the play, you don't hear I-E-W-E, -E, it's pronounced Jew, you don't hear it. But on the printed page, there's yet one more level of playfulness and wordplay and punning. Here's sonnet 135. This is one of the truly most lunatic sonnets of the entire collection, where there are about 17 occurrences of the word will. Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will, and will to boot, and will in overplus. More than enough am I that vex thee still to thy sweet will, making addition thus. 
Wilt thou whose will is large and spacious not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thee? And I'm going to stop there because this is a family-friendly program and the idea of one will being large and spacious and having a man's will hidden in it, I think I should maybe back off. But here, Will Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, there's even an I am, am I, enough am I, will am I, will I am, right? He's playing this kind of insane game making puns on his own name, will, 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 in the sense of volition, in the sense of uh, will and testament, in the sense of his name, will, in the sense of a dirty pun on a certain part of a man's anatomy. And he's lacing these crazy references through this poem. And again, it's no accident. The great Stephen Booth, and I've talked to you about his book, the sort of Bible of sonnet studies, Shakespeare's Sonnets by uh, Stephen Booth, he talks a lot about Shakespeare's crazy addiction to puns, and, and he says a great line about this particular sonnet, 135, the one with all the wills. He calls it a festival of verbal ingenuity in which much of the fun derives from the grotesque lengths the speaker goes to for a maximum number and concentration of puns. What a great line. A festival of verbal ingenuity, and the language is even grotesque in the lengths that Shakespeare goes to to make these jokes. So puns, wordplay, that's part of the dense, rich complexity of these sonnets. Another thing is their addiction and their love of paradox, which is an extraordinary feature of the sonnets and of Shakespeare more generally. There's uh, the Scottish play. I guess I'm not really in a theater, so I can name it. But, you know, I, at the moment, my house feels like it's a theater. Uh, anyway, I'm gallivanting around speaking a lot of Shakespeare, so I guess it, in fact, is a, a, is a theater. And then one of the opening lines of the Scottish play is, foul, fair is foul, and foul is fair. So paradoxes, opposites combined, uh, impossibles mixed together. And these witches come to the Scottish thane, and they tell him, fair is foul, and foul is fair. Twelfth Night is a play about identical twins, and uh, one of the most sort of important um, turning points, one of, the, one of the fulcrum points of the writing of the play, is when someone sees these two twins next to each other and says, it's a natural perspective that is and is not. It's a paradox. It's, it's both there and not there at the same time. Shakespeare loves stuff like that. He loves putting audiences in impossibilities, in things that are both black and white together, both wet and dry together, both dark and light together, both simple and complex together. This addiction to paradox is one of the absolutely central notions of Shakespeare. That's why he loved Ovid so much. Here's sonnet 43. When most I wink, meaning close my eyes, to wink is to shut your eyes. When most I wink, then do mine eyes best see. So I see best when my eyes are closed, a paradox. Why? For all the day, they view things unrespected. My eyes do when they're open, but when I sleep, in dreams they look on thee, and darkly bright are bright in dark, directed. So I see best when my eyes are closed, because when my eyes are closed, I dream, and when I dream, I think of thee. It's a paradox. And the, the sonnet concludes, all days are nights to see till I see thee. And nights, bright days, when dreams do show me thee. It's this wild puzzle of opposites being combined. There's another one, one of the central statements of gender and romance and sexuality in the sonnets is sonnet number 20. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou the master mistress of my passion. So it's a man he's talking to, but it's a man with a woman's face. And if a man has a woman's face, then it must be a master mistress, right? This, this extraordinary gender fluidity where it's not quite clear. It's, it's both. It's non-binary, this person that he's talking to, a, a master mistress. I, I, the person has a, a woman's gentle heart, has an eye more bright than theirs, a woman's, but a man in hue, his coloring, his complexion is male. And for a woman wert thou first created, 
But since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, I'm getting a little body here tonight, so forgive me. Mine be thy love and thy love's use their treasure. So this is one of the absolute central statements of paradox in all of Shakespeare. And it's at the very heart of gender studies in this sequence of poems and in Shakespeare's canon more generally. He, he's talking about things that seem tremendously modern and contemporary to our ears. A notion that gender falls apart, that everybody is somewhere on a spectrum of having both male and female gender characteristics, right? So that's Shakespeare's extraordinary love of paradox. Now, the sonnets that we've looked at up till now have been pretty straightforward. Sonnet 29, Sonnet 18, 91, 60, 30. These are sonnets that kind of do unpack themselves. It's nice to have a guide along me to help you understand them, but basically, they're pretty straightforward. They're, they're sonnets that make a kind of sense, even though the language is 400 years old, even though Shakespeare is doing complex things. But we've only got about five or six more sonnets to look at before we start getting into that thing that Booth called a festival of verbal ingenuity. Bill Irwin's right. These are dense poems. And once you get past the sort of dozen or so that are pretty straightforward and that seem to mean what the words say and whose surface meaning is quite clear, after that, the, the acrobatics of the poetry become so intense that they're deeply, deeply complex. That's why it takes a book this thick to comment on these sonnets, pages and pages and pages. And sometimes Booth will take a line I mean, that, that sonnet 135 with all those wills takes about uh, 12 pages of his book to, to gloss. I mean, you know, look at all that. That's all about just those 14 little lines. So tonight, we're going to move into uh, a, a different set of sonnets. We're going to start migrating now into the more verbally dense ones and uh, celebrate that festival of verbal ingenuity that Stephen Booth talks about. Let me quickly take you through a reminder of the form of the sonnet. Each poem has 14 lines. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong button. Each poem has 14 lines, three quatrains, and one couplet. So there are three groups of four lines and then one group of two. Three times four is 12, plus two, 14. There's a rhyme scheme, and that rhyme scheme is about the lines alternating. Right? Every other line rhymes. The last word in every other line rhymes. This is from last week's sonnet. Thought past, sought waste, flow night, woe sight, foregone or moan before. And then the couplet rhymes friend end. So that's the rhyme scheme alternating, organized by these three quatrains and a couplet. The sonnets are written in iambic pentameter which is a complex way of saying that they have a certain rhythm. And the rhythm is that the syllables alternate in stress. So an I am has two syllables. The first is unstressed, the second is stressed. It goes de-dump, and then penta means five. There are five of those, de-dump, 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 de-dump. That's iambic pentameter. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? when to the sessions of sweet silent thought. We don't say it that way. We let our instincts as a speaker of English lead the way, but we compare those instincts to what iambic pentameter says. Finally, each one of these sonnets has a turn in its argument. It's going in a certain direction, and then there is what is technically called a volta, or a turn, where the case that the sonnet is making, the story that the sonnet is telling, suddenly turns. Right? So the example I've been using is, wow, it's a drag to be stuck in my house for 10 weeks, but I've really enjoyed all the time I'm getting with my family. And that's the Volta. It really stinks to be trapped in my house for this long time, but Volta, I'm really enjoying the time I'm getting with my family. So that's the form of Shakespeare's sonnets. Going to have a little bright star water break here. Excuse me. So we're going to go through two sonnets. The first one I'm going to take you through, make a couple of points about. The second one I'm going to take you through, and then you are going to get your big chance. So here we go. Sonnet 44 by William Shakespeare. And here's how it goes. If the dull substance of my flesh were thought, injurious distance should not stop my way. If the dull substance, the heavy, the inert material of my flesh, my body, 
were thought. So it's this extraordinary Ovidian transformation. If my body were made out of thought, then injurious distance should not stop my way. Injurious distance, space that's causing me pain. I mean, you told you can't spell COVID without O-V-I-D, right? Social distancing. Well, if my body were made of thought, then this distance between us wouldn't really matter. For then, despite of space, I would be brought from limits far remote where thou dost stay. Because if I were made of thought, then no matter how much space is between us, I would be brought from territories, from boundaries far remote to where you are. So if my body were made of thought, then I wouldn't have to stick in my house. I could be right with you. Second quatrain. No matter then, although my foot did stand upon the farthest earth removed from thee. It wouldn't matter then, even if my foot, my body, even if I were standing on the farthest piece of earth removed, if I were in Tierra del Fuego, if I were in the Antipodes, if I were in the North Pole, it wouldn't matter if my body were made of thought. For nimble thought can jump both sea and land, as soon as think the place where he would be, he meaning it, thought, right? So it wouldn't matter if my dull body, if, my, if the substance of my flesh were made of thought, then distance wouldn't matter. Then no matter how far away I was from you, it wouldn't matter because I'd be nimble enough to be where you are in an instant. Third quatrain, but ah, volta, but change, turn, right? I'm so happy because I'd like to be thought, but then there's this horrible, but ah, thought kills me, that I am not thought, right? I'm not thought, I am flesh, I am far away from you, and that thought kills me. To leap large lengths of miles when thou art gone. Thought kills me that I am not thought to leap large lengths of miles when thou art gone. Great alliteration there, leap large lengths of miles when they are gone. But that so much of earth and water wrought, except that I'm, I'm, I'm made of earth and water. That's what I'm made of, earth and water. I'm not made of thought. I must attend time's leisure with my moan, right? Because I'm not actually made of thought. And in fact, I'm only made of earth and water. Then what I have to do is sit around and moan, wait on time, attend time's leisure, like I'm a servant to time attending on it, and I just sit and moan. And now comes the couplet. Receiving naught by elements so slow, that is earth and water, which are slow elements, as opposed to air and fire, the other two which are fast. Receiving naught by elements so slow, but heavy tears, badges of either's woe. So it's this sweet little poem about social distancing and about how we wish that we could be closer. If only we were made of thought, we could be together all the time because thought is nimble and thought is fast. But alas, we're made of flesh and blood. We're made of earth and water. And that makes us sad. And all we can do is cry that we are so far away from each other. Beautiful poem, perfect poem for this moment. Shakespeare says in King Henry VI, part two, faster than springtime showers come thought on thought. Thoughts are like lightning bolts in Shakespeare's plays, and this sonnet expresses that. And here's Ovid. Here's what Ovid says about the elements of earth and water, which are talked about in Sonnet 44. This is Golding's translation. This endless world contains therein, I say, four substances of which all things are engendered. Of these four, the earth and water, for their mass and weight are sunken lower. So there you see an example of Shakespeare taking Ovid, book 15, and putting it right into Sonnet. 44. I recommend Sonnet 44. It's a wonderful expression of all that we're going through right now. Okay, one more sonnet that we're going to look at. This time you're going to get to do it, so pay careful attention. Sonnet 97 by William Shakespeare. This is a beautiful one, and again, an absolutely on-the-nose poem for this moment in all of our lives. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. So I've been apart from you, and you are the pleasure of the fast-moving year. The year goes quickly, and you're the most pleasant thing about it. And being absent, being away from you, has been like winter. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. 
What freezings have I felt? What dark days seen, right? Winter things, it's cold and the days are dark. What old December's bareness everywhere. There's old December. Remember last week we talked about a budded consonant separating those Ds. What old December's bareness everywhere. So December is personified as an old guy who's bare, who doesn't have a lot of hair, right? So winter is, um, December becomes a personification of bare winter. So that's how my absence has felt. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year? What freezings have I felt? What dark days seen? What old December's bareness everywhere? And yet, this time removed was summer's time. There's that paradox. There's that Ovidian play. It's been feeling like winter to be away from you, but it's summer. I mean, again, right? That's exactly this. 75 degrees and sunny in San Diego today, and I haven't seen my friends in 10 weeks, and it's felt like winter. Yet this time removed was summer's time, the teeming autumn, big with rich increase. Summer is imagined as the entire time leading from uh, planting to harvest. So that's why it slips from summer into autumn. Big with rich increase. So uh, the poet imagines that autumn is teeming, it's pregnant, it's big with rich increase. That is, all the crops that are about to be harvested in the autumn harvest. So uh, autumn is imagined as a fertile time, pregnant with with the riches of produce. And yet this time removed was summertime, the teeming autumn big with rich increase, bearing the wanton burden of the prime. So it was made pregnant by prime, by early in the year, by the wanton, sexy burden. So spring came and sired this pregnancy that autumn is now going to deliver like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. This is an image that shows up a lot in Shakespeare. He's, he's very moved by uh, women who are pregnant when their husbands die. And so here's this image, this simile, that the autumn is pregnant with the springtime's child, like uh, the womb of a widow after the husband is dead. So the, 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 that's the person that the poet is speaking to is imagined as not only absent for a long time, but kind of dead and has fathered this child that he's never going to see, and the woman is going to carry the child who's never going to know its father. Yet, and here's the Volta, this abundant issue, right, all that harvest of autumn, this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit. That's a very complex line. There's that festival of linguistic density that Booth talked about, right? So this pregnancy, it's, it, this, all, this, all this harvest, all this richness of, of fertility is like a, the orphan's hope. Now, an orphan can't hope for any inheritance because it doesn't have parents. So orphans in Shakespeare's imagination are always kind of bereft and hopeless because they're not going to have anything bequeathed to them by their parents. Unfathered fruit. It's, it's, a, it's because the Lord is dead, because the, the person that the poem is being written to is absent. It's not there to raise those things that are going to be born. For summer and his pleasures wait on thee, right? Summer is servant to you, this person that I'm writing this poem to, right? So uh, I've been absent. It feels like winter because without you, summer is, is all about you and you're not there. And thou away, the very birds are mute. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale dreading the winters near. So this abundant issue seemed to me but hopes of orphans and unfathered fruit because summer and his pleasures wait on thee. You're the object of summer and if you're away, the birds don't sing. Or if they do sing, they don't sing happily and the leaves on the trees look pale, not green, because they're nervous that winter is about to come. So again, it's a, it's a poem of paradox. It's, it's summer but it feels like winter. Things are rich and uh, giving fruit, but they don't have a parent with them. Uh, it's summertime now, but if you're not here, it doesn't feel like summer. The birds sing, but they don't sing happily. Again, this wonderfully rich, complex, dense series of ideas that capture that love of paradox and love of complex wordplay and love of simultaneous opposites that's not just Shakespearean, but that is also 
Ovidian. So let's go through uh, some features of this language, and then you're going to get your turn. Remember, we always take Shakespeare one line at a time. He writes in iambic pentameter, 10 beats at a time, and that's how, we're, that's how we best speak the, these poems, right? Wrong button again. Oh my goodness, what's happening to me tonight? Okay, one line at a time. Here are some examples. What happens at the end of each line is you get an opportunity to think the next idea. How like a winter hath my absence been? What? From what? From thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me, what? What, what image am I going to compare it to? but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit. So there's this little springboard for thought at the end of each line. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer, what? That leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. So there's just this moment for thought, and that's why it's important to go through Shakespeare one line at a time, take a piece of paper, cover up the poem, reveal one line, read it, reveal the next line, read it, reveal the next line, read it. It will make instant sense, one line at a time. Always look at the verbs in Shakespeare's poems, and here's the verbs in, in this sonnet. Been, fleeting, freezings, have felt, seen, removed, teeming, increase, widowed, seemed, unfathered, wait, tis, look, dreading. And again, we use any form of speech that comes from a verb, so we can use a participial adjective, we can use a gerund. If it comes from a verb, we want it. Antithesis, opposition. Well, this poem has a gigantic antithesis in it. Winter versus summer. That's the whole big idea. Felt, seen, abundant issue, hope of orphans, mute, sing. There are these series of opposites along the way, but it's built on this extraordinary paradox of saying that winter and summer are existing simultaneously. It's antithetical in its deep structure. Finally, we look at how the language changes height. It's not all complex and poetic. Some of it is extremely simple. Uh, how like uh, winter hath this absence been? Uh, simple language. It doesn't have a lot of complex Shakespearean uh, ornateness to it sometimes. And so we have to be careful to treat the language at the level of complexity it is. This brings me to something that we call the wooden O, and I'm going to go back to sonnet 44, right? Uh, there's a phrase in Henry V where he talks about the theater that they're in, which was a wood structure, as a wooden O, because it's a circular building. But for actors, the wooden O is something else. Remember in sonnet 44, he said, but ah, thought kills me that I am not thought. Often in Shakespeare, we'll see O. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I, says Hamlet. Now, the modern actor and even the self-conscious poetry reader will have an inclination to make those O's and O's naturalistic. Ah, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. But ugh, thought kills me that I am not thought. That's a mistake. You want to treat those ahs and ohs as words, as big sounds that release emotion. But ah, thought kills me that I am not thought. Or oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. So we want to avoid the wooden oh, uh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. And we want to let that oh out as a big word, oh. What a rogue and peasant slave am I. That's the wooden O. And relatedly, vowels. Now, this sonnet is an extraordinary example of Shakespeare's addiction to vowel sounds. We talked about assonance last week, the repetition of a vowel sound. Well, let's talk about the implication of that in a poem like this one. All those uh, words there in orange are uh, E sounds. The, fleeting, year, freezings, seen, December, teeming, increase, decease, seemed, me, the, cheers, leaves, near. And actors learn to go for these vowel sounds like a singer does. These are the big open sounds that release emotion. Consonants shape that sound, but vowels release it. I had a great teacher named Cicely Berry. There she is. 
passed away a couple of years ago. Dear, dear, dear sis, may she rest in peace. She was the head of voice and speech at the Royal Shakespeare Company for years and years and years, the doyen of speech on the Shakespearean stage. And she used to do an exercise where she would have actors recite a, a, a piece of Shakespeare saying only the vowels and not the consonants. So how like a winter hath my absence been from thee the pleasure of the fleeting year would sound not from thee the pleasure of the fleeting year, but uh, e, uh, e, uh, 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 e, e, e. And you know, you had these people wandering around this room going e, u, u, ah, e, e, like they were, I don't know, walking on fire or walking on coals or something like that. And I, we would do these exercises where she'd have 50 actors in the room and you'd have these people running around e, u, e, 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 u, ah, oh, crazy, crazy, crazy pants uh, kind of acting exercise. But it's a great, great, great revelation because it shows you that this kind of poem is expressing something that's painful and weird. E has been E absent from you has been E E freezing E and it really puts you in the emotional place of the poem. And so there's dear, dear, wonderful Sis Berry. I thank you for all that you taught me, which I use all the time. And uh, we're going to get lots of folks on the internet tonight thinking of you. Okay. Sonnet 97 by William Shakespeare. I'm going to get out of here and we're all going to go through it together. Ready? Here we go. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. What freezings have I felt, what dark days seen, what old December's bareness everywhere. And yet, this time removed was summer's time, the teeming autumn big with rich increase, bearing the wanton burden of the prime, like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. Yet, this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit, for summer and his pleasures wait on thee, and thou away, the very birds are mute. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. A lovely, stunning poem built on puzzle and paradox and complexity, and yet it expresses something that all of us feel so deeply right now. I love that poem, and I'm so grateful to you for letting me share it. There's my email address, hi Barry at theoldglobe.org. If you have anything you want to know, send me, a, send me an email. I'll hang out here on Facebook for a few minutes. And if you liked tonight's program and if you've been following the Globe's arts engagement work and its artistic work and its humanities work like this program, please take a visit to the Globe Rising page of our website and consider a contribution to help keep our theater and more important, our people intact until that happy day when we can reopen. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate your being here tonight. Um, it's great to spend this time with you. Don't panic. Be brave. Be kind. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Thanks so much. Good night. <laughs>